And now uh, the part of the evening we've, we've all been waiting for. Uh, first of all, let me assure you, you will not be deprived of dessert. Dessert is going to be served quietly and surreptitiously while we listen to our next speaker. Uh, and uh, it is my great pleasure to be the person who is going to introduce Paul Samuelson. Uh, not, not all great scientists are also great teachers. Einstein was a great scientist, but he relied on others to explain his scientific theories to beginners and to non-physicists. Paul Samuelson, however, is universally recognized as both a great scientist, in my judgment, the greatest living economist, and a great teacher. The greatest teachers have two traits in common. They have a passion for their subject, and they take pleasure in sharing their, no their knowledge with the broadest possible audience. Even before he became the first American to receive the Nobel Prize in Economic Science, Paul Samuelson became famous as the author of the leading introductory textbook in economics, aptly entitled Economics. <laughs> My personal relationship with Paul began through his textbook when I was a high school senior in Brooklyn Tech in 1959. Uh, I don't recall which edition we studied, but since the first edition was published in 1948, uh, my guess is that mine was the third or fourth. Anyone who reads Samuelson's textbook comes away feeling familiar with the author. The congeniality, and the wit shine through its pages. The writing style is casual, yet very precise. In 1998, on the 50th anniversary of Samuelson's uh, economics, McGraw-Hill, the publisher, published a reprint of the first edition. I got a copy and read through it for the first time. I was amazed to discover that it contained far more practical personal economics, career choice, personal investing, than the subsequent editions that I had studied myself in high school and then taught later as a professor of economics. I think it is fair to say that with each edition, more and more of the personal economics was dropped and replaced with more on government economic policy and the technical models used to analyze government policy. Perhaps Paul can tell us why. My guess is that econ professors who are the ones, after all, who choose the textbooks, wanted to teach more technical economics in the introductory course, so the more practical material was crowded out. Paul's range of published work is by no means confined to his textbook and his articles in scholarly journals. He takes delight in writing for the interested layman. For several years in the 1970s, he wrote a column for Newsweek magazine. How many of you used to read that? His articles 
were as simple as possible, but never simpler. He once wrote a column using only one syllable words. And it was about finance. That's correct. <laughs> finance in one syllable. A recurring topic, a topic in these Newsweek columns was what economic science tells us about how to invest. He was an early and steady advocate of index funds as a low-cost, efficient method of investing in a diversified portfolio. He has consistently warned against believing the mistaken proposition that in the long run, stocks are sure to beat bonds. There is no one more suited than Paul to open a conference devoted to the application of economic science to improving the practice of life cycle saving and investing. I give you Paul Samuels. They tell me that when you drown, your whole life goes before your eyes. It's a little bit like that when you get a long introduction. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, it, but it's worse than that when the introducer steals so many of your punchlines. <laughs> Still, I will struggle on. The title I was assigned was, Is Personal Finance a Science? And I think that that title is ill-expressed. Its wordings might seem to be asking, is personal finance an exact science? And of course, the answer to that is a flat no. And so, if this disappoints anyone in this audience, now is a very good time to rectify your miscalculation by leaving. <laughs> what I do hope to address is what kind of inexact science personal finance is. Actually, earliest political economy in Aristotle, or even in Holy Scriptures, began as the management of the household. You can't be more low-down personal than that. My Harvard mentor, Joseph Schumpeter, in a crescendo of brainstorming, once went so far as to claim that solving the numerical problems of economics, one pig for three hens rather than for four or five, was the effective Darwinian evolutionary selection force which made us humans become human. Descartes, opined, I think, therefore, I am. Schumpeter out-opined Descartes, asserting, because we humanoid primates had to struggle with personal finance, we became human. Well, in our introductory economic textbooks, which have been mentioned here, Robinson Crusoe all, always played a starring role, and rightly so. Some 50,000 years ago, Agriculture, broadly defined, was the only existent industry. Each farm and hunting family had little reason to trade with their 20 to 50 known neighbors, neighbors who were virtual clones of themselves. I do not jest. As recently as around 1970, one of my many sons spent his summer away from Milton Academy with his new temporary mother on a peasant farm in Lower Austria. That's a region where no marriages took place before the female candidate proved her fertility by becoming pregnant. <laughs> and so along with his newly widowed mother, he acquired a new older brother. Virtually all that the family consumed was grown on their peasant farm. Slaughtering the hog was the big event of the summer, and nothing in that hog went unconsumed. Pure personal finance once again. But alas, 
devil nicotine ended that bucolic scenery of self-sufficiency. His new brother became addicted to cigarette smoking. This requires cash, and to get cash, you must shift to some cash crop for the first time. That's more or less how and why personal finance became perforce market-oriented as it is today almost everywhere. Well, I spoke of elementary textbooks, and so did Svee. My McGraw-Hill bestseller came out back in 1948. For the 50-year celebration of it, I had to reread this brainchild. It, when Samuel Johnson uh, reread re his failed play, Irene, he said, alas, I thought it had been better. <laughs> mine, was the, mine was the opposite reaction. God, how good this, <laughs> this was. I discovered that apparently mine was the first primer ever to devote a full chapter to personal finance. Series E savings bonds, diversified mutual funds, how much more sons-in-law earned who are doctors and lawyers than clergymen, dishwashers, cab drivers, or sonographers. Human capital. I never got a Nobel Prize for it. <laughs> Fifty years later, I was pleasantly surprised to read, you know, this is a boasting uh, lecture. <laughs> I was pleasantly surprised to reread in the new facsimile edition of that 1948 original, much like the following words. This is a paraphrase. Of course, America's post-1935 Social Security system, whose creation I was in on, which was formulated deliberately I don't want to lose any pearls of wisdom. <laughs> In Depression times, to intentionally discourage savings and to coax into retirement job hoggers, of course, that will have to be abandoned in the future as a pay-as-you-go, non-actuarial financial system. Such systems begin with seductively favorable pension rates that are transitional only and must mandate stiffer contributions in future stationary or declining demographic states. 1948, not, not too bad. <laughs> Hold the applause. <laughs> This was apparently one of my first initiations into overlapping generation economics. You might even say that in my small way, I was then being John the Baptist to latter-day Larry Kotlikoff, who was known deservedly around Central Square as Mr. Generational Accounting. Life cycle finance a la Franco Modigliani recognizes that as mammals, we all do begin with the free lunch. As mortals, we are all going to die. But prior to that event, with few exceptions, we'll need to be supported in retirement years by personal finance. And as we used to think before Reagan and the two Bushes, old age pensions might come partly out of Social Security public finance. My brief words here will focus on personal life cycle finance. That is a domain full of shucks, shucks, ordinary common sense. Alas, common sense is not quite the same thing as good sense. Good sense in these esoteric puzzles is hard, apparently, to come by. Here's a recent example. Life cycle retirement mutual funds are one current rage. Fund A is for the youngster in this audience who will be retiring in 2042. I suppose that's our Federal Reserve Chairman. <laughs> call, call her A. B is for 2015 retirees. And A and B's life cycle 
fund. Both might begin with, say, 65 percent in risky stocks, allegedly risky stocks, and 35 percent in allegedly safer bonds. But even without anyone having to make a phone call, B will move earlier than A to pare down on risky, risky stocks and goose up exposure to safe bonds. Uh, perhaps the editor of this series will remove the verb goof, goose from my informal text. The logic for this apparently is simple, as simple as that 2 plus 2 equals 4, and that the next nine years is a shorter horizon period than the next 36 years. That law of averages, proved over and over again in Las Vegas or even at the ballpark, tells us, allegedly tells us, that riskiness for a pooled sample of, say, 36 items is only half what it is for a pooled sample of only nine horizons. The well-known square root of n verity, or the not-so-well-known square root of n fallacy. Now, Milton Friedman is assuredly no dummy. Just ask him. <laughs> Maybe he'd recall from his course in statistics that the ratio of square root of 9 to the ratio to square root of 36 measures how less risky stocks are in the sense that the long horizon portfolio endures only half the stock riskiness of the short horizon portfolio. You can see I've been paid by Svi Bodhi to <laughs> sp spread his po poison. But don't copy down my fuzzy arithmetic. It's only blue smoke, sound and fury, signifying nothing. Actually, I have three triplet sons. That's the only true part of the story I'm about to say. <laughs> I'll call them Tom, Dick, and Harry to protect their privacy. All three are risk-averse chips off the old block. They're very risk-averse with their money, but they weren't that way with my money. <laughs> This means that unless the mean gains of a portfolio exceeds its mean loss, they'll avoid such an investment. However, Tom is less paranoid than Dick, while Harry is even more risk-averse than Dick. Nevertheless, this is all lies, all three will shun life cycle funds. For each of their 25 years until retirement, each will hold constant the fractional weight of risky equities. Tom's constant is three quarters equities, one quarter bonds. Dick's is half and half. Suspicious Harry stands at only one quarter. By the way, it would be better to make that suspicious Harriet, but the president of Harvard got in a lot of trouble <laughs> with, <laughs> with that kind of <laughs> conjecture. Nothing is off the record. <laughs> How do I know that? Because in my family, we eat our own cooking. Also a lie. <laughs> I have written 70, 11 learned papers denying that the correct law of large numbers vindicates the common sense erroneous notion about risk of erosion when investment horizons grow from 1 to 10 or from 100 to 10,000. Now, if you think I just criticize the idiots who belong to behavioral science, you, you, you underestimate me. <laughs> I criticize the pure mathematicians from Berkeley and Bell Labs who say, that's wrong. What you should do is you should maximize the rate of growth of a portfolio and you should behave like a geometric mean maximizers. And I've written 9011 papers uh, controverting that view. Well, mine has been the Lord's work, but it has brought me no second Nobel Prize. He complained, complained, complained. 
But even when I go to write articles using only one syllable words to rebut the many pure mathematicians who believe that all of the, us should seek only to maximize our portfolio's long time growth, uh, I'm like Roger Dangerfield. I get no respect and I get no converts. My doctrine is applied math is too important to be left to pure math types and also too important to be left to idiots. I console myself, though, by repeating over and over Mark Twain's wisdom. Hold your breath. You think he's just a humorist. You know, in kindergarten, I was not very good in separating pages. <laughs> Quote, you will never correct by logic a man's error if that error did not get into his mind by logic. By the way, we should put then the plural and, and make it gender free. Uh, it would apply. Well, with Svi Bodhi on this program, I can hurry on to new personal finance topics. Surprisingly, housing will be one of them. Why housing in a personal finance seminar? Life cycle personal finance seminar. I'll leave it to Yale's Bob Schiller or Wellesley's Chip Chase, but not before articulating my 1958 point on overlapping generations, that money aside, people's homes are an ideal contrivance for converting working age savings into retirement day dis savings. I even wrote an unsuccessful foreword for a little book on the, uh, uh, the uh, disappearing mortgage uh, Reva Poor's uh, book, uh, A Good Cause That Never Got Very Far, It Was Ahead of Its Time. Well, President George Bush has advocated so far unsuccessfully that those of us covered by Social Security should be allowed to transfer into our own accounts our fair share of what's been paid into the public fund on our account. That way, the I'm just quoting, uh, the long-term sure thing surplus yield of common stocks over bonds can be a wind at our back, augmenting our golden years of retirement. Besides, his words, it's our money, not the government's. Well, don't shoot the piano player. I'm only quoting from White House handouts. I'm not a prophet. I can't guarantee for you that risk corrected stocks will outperform bonds from 2006 to 2050. However, if the U.S. electorate wants to drink from that whiskey bottle and bet on that view, private accounts are not the efficient way to implement it. Ask MIT's Peter Diamond for sermons on this topic. A century of economic history about private and public financial markets strongly nominates one huge diversified index social security fund utilizing both stocks and bonds and both domestic and foreign holdings and that that will produce for the next generations better retirement pensions along with what's important better sleep at night and one of its unique often overlooked virtues is that beneficial mutual insurance reinsurance among adjacent generations becomes possible under that arrangement. Of course, this sensible, good sense sensible, not common sense sensible, proposal is too efficient ever to be adopted. To adopt it would free some millions of financial employees to transfer It builds up suspense, doesn't it? <laughs> Man's work is never done. Transfer into useful plumbing, beer brew brewing, or barbering. Never forget the old saw, insurance is sold, not bought. People have been shocked, and I've testified before Congress, about 50% loads on various guaranteed funds. And they never realize, since the beginning of time, 
every insurance salesman has always gotten at least 50% of the first year's uh, uh, premiums. Same goes for stocks, bonds, and lottery coupons. Plagiarizing Abraham Lincoln, I can say, God must love those common folk that behavior science economists write about because she made so many of them. <laughs> Fortunately, there, I have to end with a good note. There have been some good social inventions. If the poet Browning asked me, did you see Shelley playing? I have to answer no. But I did see close up my Harvard graduate school buddy, Bill Greeno. It was his Harvard PhD thesis that invented for TIA craft the variable lifetime annuity invested efficiently in common stocks. My secretary has for invested, invented efficiently, invested efficiently. And early on, I did write blurbs for Jack Bogle's successful launching of Vanguard's no-load rock-bottom fee S&P 500 stock mutual funds. Uh, God is in the ad libs, so if I can interfere with myself. Uh, some mistakes in life have been happy mistakes. I'll go outside of my field of economics to different fields. Enrico Fermi, a great Italian experimentalist and theorist, uh, split the atom in 1934. He didn't know he had done it. He wasn't interested in the energy things. He put paraffin over his equipment to suppress the energy effects. But by 1939, uh, Leitner and a woman uh, and her nephew, Frisch uh, deduced that he had actually split a large molecule into two small mo molecules. And Zillard, a learner-like eccentric, actually patented uh, this way of creating energy. Why do I say that was a happy mistake, this delay of five years? Because without any doubt, if it had been understood in 1934, Hitler in 1939 would have had a nuclear fission bomb. And not only would history be different, but perhaps the planet w w would, would be different. Well, uh, the discovery or the implementation of the low load, low expense, low activity S&P 500 of the Vanguard type could have followed the exchange traded uh, equivalent of recent times. I think that the, uh, it, it's pretty much an even Stephen thing and it's a, a, illusory that you really have an advantage of being able to call any time of the day and, and trade. But I know human nature and uh, the invention of that would have been not serving my risk-averse triplets. It would be serving the people who want action in Las Vegas and would like to have it equally in the Chicago Board of Trade on exchange, exchange traded. So it was better that the uh, prosaic mutual fund form got the start before the other one. Of course, this is all personal opinion, and you have to take it with a grain of salt. Well, along with the chimpanzee hero who invented the wheel, and those Neanderthal heroes who discovered how to make cheese cheese, and how to make cider hard cider, in my Valhalla of famous heroes, you'll find the names of Greeno and Bogle. My final words are cut short by this audience's somewhat well-fed drowsiness. <laughs> I'll leave as questions for later discussion. Will hedge funds make our golden years more golden? Or will the new products of option engineers 
instead of reducing risks by permitting them to be spread optimally, in fact, by making possible something like 100 to 1 over leveraging, result in micro losses for pension funds, or even threaten the macro system with lethal financial future implosions. Good teachers always end their lectures with a question, and that's what I've done. And fortunately, if you can say the course, maybe Bob Merton will give the answer to my last question. Thank you. If we have a time for a few yeah. questions. We definitely have some time for a few questions. Uh, do we have, here's a mic. So if you have a question, raise your hand. Here we go. So, so how should the um, social security system be, be transformed? Well, I don't know why Peter Diamond wasn't in the middle, <laughs> but John Chauvin is here and probably ready to leap to his feet and uh, answer your question. Not tonight, though. John, John says not tonight. I, I don't think, by the way, that uh, uh, it's a, uh, uh, a girdle-like unsolvable question. There are lots of uh, sensible ways of of doing it. Yeah, that is that is going to be a big part of session five on on Friday morning. Jeff. Uh, can we expect individuals to thank you. Can we expect individuals to know enough about what they're doing for their own financial responsibility to take responsibility or are we obliged to basically not allow them to have that responsibility and somehow do them for do it for them. I don't think it, um, the Darwinian evolution is very slow, and so all of you here have about the same brains that uh, uh, Cicero and the classical people uh, had. So I don't think people are going to automatically uh, get wise. These are complicated questions. The part of behavioral uh, economics, which is very important, is a psychological fact uh, which you appreciate even more as you get older. Skinnerisms, uh, do it now. Uh, uh, Fred Skinner says, if you see a weather report that's going to rain and you're over 39, take your umbrella and put it on the door so that you will have that that crutch uh, to, to take the umbrella. So the various ways in which uh, kindly and intelligent corporate employers organize for their employees the defined uh, defined contribution systems are, are extremely important and those automatic things where de clever default choices that are made automatic, I think will help a lot. It will also, it'll also help if there is a great core of well-informed financial advisors who in arm's length transactions with people who need their information will provide it. I have taught at MIT for uh, 65 years. In the course of time, there have been a number of dead professors. Uh, and often a dead professor, just the way we live, leaves a widow. Uh, more widows than widowers. And somehow to my door come a procession of widows. It's not a, a, a trade I, I buck for. <laughs> And the question they ask me is, where can I get good financial advice? And I, I've been stymied. 
I've generally said, beware the people who give you free financial advice. Because I learned the most horrendous stories about people who, for example, within the year are going to have to have a heavy estate tax, and their financial advisor puts them in uh, high load uh, one year bond, bonds that they're only going to hold for, for for one year. The only way they can exist is by churning your portfolio. They can make a bare living if they don't, and they can make a good living if, if, if they do. So uh, it would be a lot to have foundations which educate better the brokers of the land, although that could be a two-edged <laughs> <laughs> Ed sword, but to have them uh, with respect to financial. Now, I should feel grateful because a lot of the original sales of my textbook, perhaps because of that personal finance, were to chartered underwriter courses during this very long bull market uh, period, story of my life, uh, and uh, that's part of the Lord's work, I guess. Yes. Larry? Thank you. Thank you. Um, the, the, uh, personal finance is about the only advanced technology that every responsible citizen seems to have to master for himself or, as you would helpfully add, herself. Uh, I don't need to know what makes a car go. I just drive the car. Uh, experts on engineering are there to make a car go. Do you see financial products or services emerging, and if so, what are they, or policy changes emerging that would move personal finance more toward the car model, where one car is about as good as another due to competition, and individuals don't quite have as much of an opportunity to ruin their futures through bad decisions. Well, I mean, there, there are lots of institutional changes and, and actual changes. For example, there is something intrinsically extremely sensible about annuities. Because we, most of us know when we were born, but the last thing we'll know is when we die. Uh, and that uncertainty uh, is something which can be uh, insured. But annuities have not been uh, bogalized, generally speaking, have, have not been uh, of the vanguard type, TIA craft in, in, in some, some degree. There could be a lot, a lot more of, uh, of that. Uh, and. Uh, uh, well, if, if I knew a lot more inventions, I would have just made them. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Sanders.